All right, let's start. So today we're going to talk about how we have evidence for macroevolutionary ideas. Okay, and there's various strains of evidence. And so, for you today, the learning objectives are to think like a macroevolutionary biologist or a paleontologist and reconstruct a community. Okay, and when you learn how biologists get evidence for macroevolutionary processes. Right, because a lot of macroevolutionary processes happen over a long time scale. Right, you can't go out and like mess with stuff to look at it. So how do we figure out, figure things out? How do we, how do we, if people have competing ideas, how do we fight and see who, who's right? Right, with macroevolution. So what you do is break up into groups of, and this actually two would work in this class. Three groups of two. Look at your fossils. Right. Um, what species live in the area where I got these samples from? Okay. Um, What's the climate like? And don't just think about the plants, too. I mean, obviously, you can see there's plants there. But what else lives there? Um, what's the climate like? What else can you glean from them? Okay. So try to get to extract as much information as you can from your samples. Okay. And after class, wash your hands, please. So you don't. None of this is like poison ivy. No, I'm, I'm, pretty sure it's, I'm pretty sure none of it's poison ivy. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I study ants. You study ants. I don't know plant stuff well. I look, yeah, I've touched everything, and I, I've survived so far. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. So what species live here? Are you also studying termites? Nope. Just ants? Just ants, some beetles, these two. Now I just do, like, methods. I'm sure you can put that clip up of the termites. I was on the ant side. It's a very You could, but I can bring down.
All right, let's start. So what I need to do is tell me one thing you've learned, and I want people from other groups to disagree with it if they can. Right? I mean, we're, we're trying to be skeptical scientists, right? So anytime I present something, you should be like, ah, oh, but what about that weird thing in Madagascar? That doesn't make you that. As I want you to be thinking it's that way here. So if someone says, I think that there's sunlight there, it's like, no! It could be chemosynthesis and the firefly light or something. So think, think about that, you know? <coughs> I mean, don't be crazy, but definitely be critical, okay? And try, and then be able to defend defend their their hypothesis. All right. So who wants to go first? We think that there are insects present because there's little holes in the leaves where they like eaten them. Okay. Do people just get fungi? Well, first, first, does anyone? We'll go, that's good, but uh, does anyone disagree with that? That there, that there might be yeah. insects there. It could be berries. No, no, no. Leprechauns maybe. Fairies, no. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Um, any other explanation for holes in the leaves? Small gastropods. Small gastropods, right. So it could be snails rather than, or slugs rather than insects. Okay, it could be a pathogen. And presumably people who know things better than I do could tell, like, oh, yes, that's the, that's, I mean, like, like his spine beetles are very characteristic of leaf damage. And so, a couple people there could say, oh, yes, that's definitely a chewing from an, from an lepidopteran larva or something. It is? Okay. So, <laughs> right. But it's good to think about other things that could cause chewing damage or holes like that. Good. Okay. So, fungus. How do you know fungus? Well, I mean, in the roots. So, do you see 
So is Wildcat the Maker Rising? Oh. Uh, and if we knew the third, we'd say, okay, this group, you know, is all the good Maker Rising, so we can say that. So let's just think about this. I don't think that in some ways competition, they might just have different access to resources and different availability. How would that not be competition? Like just different locations. Just <coughs> by nature being in different locations. Okay. What do we have that? Okay, so can you put the choice location? Darwin actually has some really important pieces of great code where thinking about like um, struggle for survival, because you know in software if you're struggling with each other, but then you know if you're in a northern area of it, you know, it's pretty mad because the people are struggling and it's lost and like that. So there's no competition anymore. But this happened at Bethlehem Hall, so I should I believe. Large terrestrial vertebrate that kills yeah. trees and brings things around. Yeah. <laughs> we get trees killing a drop of dumping somewhere. Yeah. I think they have bark to arc trees. Could be a bush, but they're pretty big. And they're <coughs> so I don't think it would be a bush. Six. <coughs> and maple leaf. Yeah, so maple is always born in trees. Yeah. Okay. Other people will disagree with that? One thing you could say is, well, we know bark floats, right? We know bark just float. So it could be that there are trees elsewhere and it's been transported down to our site. That's something to worry about, too. Flowers, what do you think? Oh, I was just saying that the freshwater uh, flowers probably get the leaves and all the insects. Anyone disagree with that? They get too leaves, right? So do you have already have a flood flower for them? That's true, the flower could be, you know, please, please pollinate me, there's no pollinators there, because they can't just go through the pollinators. I mean, so don't just think that things thrive on islands. We can like, make them, you know, they're going to be selfing because we can't find the right pollinator. So that would be. So all angels are flower pollinators? You know? People with the grass pollen, like especially the bees carrying hives to get to the nose. It's actually windborne pollen, it's actually weed pollen, so I'll say anything about wind pollen. I'm trying to think of a brightly colored flower that's not weed pollinated and not insect pollinated. Like a hummingbird pollinated? Yes, hummingbird pollinated. Good. Actually, bat pollinated ones. Oh, there's yeah, a bee pollinated one. Um, dandelions. Dandelions are like very sexual. So they still, their ancestors were presumably sexual and produced you know, bright, showy flowers and bring stuff in. And now they no longer need that, right? 
that selection is strong enough to get rid of that trait. That's cool. So you can think of these selections very powerful, but it doesn't work instantly. You have things that you know, are still persist despite you know, no selection for them. So we like that too. Good. Other, what, what else can we discover? Okay, why do you say that? Mm -hmm. Anyone disagree with that? Yeah. It may not be moist year round, it might be always like certain periods of time, but yeah, that's a question. <coughs> shady, why do you say so shady? It must have really shady habits. It's good. Perfect. What else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah those pieces that pick up the, every single leaf has been hit by some type. So it must be different in some way that kills it. And it could be different in secondary compounds that, like, you know, some species evolve to say, oh, that's tasty, right? I love the taste of spinach. I just taste for spinach in the environment. Spinach, I eat spinach. Right? And then the other things would be equally tasty, but it can't detect that it's food because it doesn't have the spinach flavor. So it could be something like that, or it could be that, you know, some are chemically defended, some are defended, um, you know, physically, so like grasses. Right? And why do uh, uh, grazers have um, big big teeth, because grasses have silicon, we use sandpaper all the time. And so, <coughs> we need big teeth to deal with it, so maybe some things can't deal with that. Good. What else can we figure out? So we could have small herbivores, right. Um, must we? Okay. So yeah, so this is, so this is a habitat that's consistently having small herbivores, but it could be that something's what's called small herbivore diet. Right? So, unless, we, unless we see feeding damage this one, then we can see like those squirrel teeth in there. Like we could find. What else? Can you disagree with that? Oh, no, it was when it's on. Yeah. You're in the line of fire. Okay. What's, what's, what's other evidence for that? Okay. So we know something about biomes and so broadly that you know, like moist habitats, rough shady habitats. Um, actually people who do paleoclimate can look at their portion of leaves in an area that have teeth. Um, so some of these have more teeth on them than others. And so we can tell something about you know, if you do um, cover layer you can tell something about the temperature in the area based on the portion of leaves that have teeth in the area. So you can obviously think of drip drips, but that would be a little loose now if you can see dripping water out from that. And things like that, the information about temperature and rainfall is kind of, you know, the same as when you're in the neighborhood. And it's like, it's just like this. Actually, this is something that someone else said about doing that with the policy and the context. What else? <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Frozen lettuce, right. It's when you, we miss the obvious, right? We're like, yeah, green things get energy from the sun, right? Not all environments get energy from the sun. 
I have nothing even that doesn't. Film events, right? So you can just see, who seen, have you seen videos of these? Of white tube around and they're red, you know? Um, so those, those ones just covered this little, I think, I think 1975, something like that. And it's really recent discovery that, like, oh, wait, all that doesn't depend on the sun. You have these deep sea vents, it's much like this. Yeah. Yeah. So we know we don't have that. But we know that that's, that's not the only thing happening. Right? So there could still be chemosynthetic organisms in this environment. We know there's at least a lot of photosynthetic ones. Yeah. What else? What else? There's bacteria everywhere. And so presumably these bacteria, if we had better, you know, if you had an SEM on your desk, you could look at it, or you could grind it up and get DNA, perhaps, and it's a piece of Yep. Good. What else? Anything else? Yeah. Okay, moderate level. Why do you say that? Okay. Six out of, so I could give you a sample of six things from the tropics, and you have six different things. How you know it's not bothering you there? You're, you're right. Just... Mm -hmm. Right, so you have, not only do you have six things, but you have many of those things. The six things, right? It's not for many of them. So if I had, you know, every time I go out and pick something up, it's a new thing, then it's just they have lots of biodiversity. If I pick up something that's it's new and then pick up something else, it's the same thing, pick something else, the same thing, pick something else, new. The same thing, then tells me something about how people we have things in the environment. Right? <coughs> Next, people do that when trying to estimate them species. So, is this um, Terry Irwin, who's a famous scientist who went out to the tropics and the canopy fogger? Which I've done this for a long time, it's crazy. You take a tree, a giant, beautiful tree, um, put white sheet underneath it, you spray pesticide all through the tree. And just have a rain of things dying. And then you go through and look at what's there. <coughs> and you can see both, you know, how many species there are in that particular tree, or how abundant they are, and then you can go to the next tree over and do the same thing. And if you know the next tree over, the next tree, you know, a mile away or ten miles away, has exactly the same thing, you might say, oh, I've gotten everything. Right? But if I find that half the things are just are new again, so there's something about, you know, how many things I have in general. And so we can um, uses this sort of approach to figure out the estimate number of some the number of species in the planet or here are number of species in our samples. Yeah. Any questions about that? All right, any, anything else about this study? So it's pretty cool that, you know, just from a few handfuls of stuff, you know, you can you can first think about habitat, you know, herbivory. Um, you know, temperature, rainfall, um, biodiversity, right? All from just a few samples of things, okay? And people were critical, and they could have said, you know, that's wrong, but, you know, some things we argued, but other things people sort of agreed with, right? So, what sort of how we work with macro pollution, right? So some things are contentious, we could argue about them, some things would make sense, but this still gives us also evidence for what's happened in the past. <coughs> so, different ways of getting evidence in macroevolution. One is molecular fossils, trace fossils, body fossils, phylogenetics, woo, excellent organisms, and experiments. So I work on this, but I'll do it. early life, right? So it's hard to find a, a fossil of bacteria. Right? Um, people argue they have, but you know, from really old stuff, it's hard to find fossils. But you can look at the length of carbon <coughs> chains in fossil, in fossil sediment. So sediment that contains what we think are fossils. And look for characteristic spaces in the life. Right? So <coughs> in this case, you know, these insight must have been odd. And this sort of uh, sequence suggests this is formed by organic processes in terms of in twos rather than abiotic processes. Okay. This is some basic chemical evidence that there's life here. Well, what else sort of chemical evidence could we use?
Yeah, so what is the sort of chemical evidence you could use to suggest that there's life in, this, in, this, in the sediment? Okay, how so? So oxygen is very reactive, right? And so early Earth, a lot of the, ox a lot of the oxygen combined with rocks and rusted. Okay? Mars is red because of the oxygen combined with the rocks. Um, but if later rocks also have oxygen, how's the oxygen getting back out? Or could be from life. Good. What else? Yeah. Again? Nitrogen? How's that? Right, so if you know that if you see like very little biological active like in the like, section that has the dimension in it, and so this was put down by fixers, perfect, yep. Carry <coughs> evidence from isotopes. Like, what are isotopes? Not only even, but unequal. Yeah, so different different numbers of them, right? So, what gives you know oxygen its chemical properties is the number of of protons and electrons, right? It gives a sort of general electron cloud shape and things like that. What do the neutrons do? Not quite. So that number, that element comes from the number of protons. Right. So hydrogen has one proton, it can have one, two, one, zero, one, two neutrons. It's still hydrogen. Right, so there's, there's, you know, weak and strong nuclear forces that help keep the nucleus together, and that's affected by the neutron structure, both of the neutrons and protons together, right? Good. Which, for biological things, they don't really care about it much, right? Because not a lot of, you know, nuclei are being broken apart. Um, in biology, in, you know, in a way that affects a biolog biological. So, um, yeah? It just affects like the mass of the atom. Mm -hmm. Right, the mass affects the mass of the atom. Good. And <coughs> we find that um, even a little bit of mass differences between, you know, carbon 12 and carbon 13, carbon 14, um, affects how they're uptaken by organisms. It's slight. You know, extent of difference. Okay. And we can see as your things go through the food chain, that slight bias is being magnified. And so you can see sort of how many steps have gone through the food chain, um, as well as you know where the, the, the source came from from looking at these isotopes. Okay. So we can use these ratios to figure out um, how you can change the time. You know, we know that certain certain organisms, how they process carbon. Tend to bias different ways than other ones. So you have to say, okay, look, this one's the more common. This one's the signature of the carbon in the rocks. Okay. Yeah. 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 Any questions about that? Other sorts of evidence could be chirality. What's that? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, we'll, we'll right the end. So, you know, are my hands the same? No. They're not quite, what, what's different about them? Let's go from laundry here. Right. The same basic shape, but one's a left hand, one's a right hand. Right? So molecules are the same thing. Some, some molecules are the same thing. So I have a carbon atom, and I have four things coming off them. There's actually two ways to arrange it, such that I can't superimpose them on each other. I have the chirality. And life is chiral. And actually, one of the things we talked about when we talked about the origin of life is how do you go from most chemical reactions do you think of an equal chirality, right? equally left and right, but biologically most of our things are one-handedness. 
how do you get that bias going from inorganic processes to organic processes? And this thought about it has to do with you know, forming life on a, on a clay matrix or an ice matrix or something like that. <coughs> but out of this flight we'd be planning those entire molecules of the component of this. Okay. Any questions about that? Um, we can also use information like this to get at things like temperature, right? So here is you know, modern temperature, and then that's really done. Okay. So we can use things like isotope ratios preserved in rocks to tell something about temperature. Um, you know, other measures too. We can figure out, you know, we, can, we can't put a thermometer back in the patients, right? So how do we know how hot the patients was? So we can use things like this to actually infer these temperatures. Okay. Why do we care about paleo temperature? Right, we live there. So we find, for example, dinosaur fossils in Antarctica. Right? Now, the only dinosaurs in Antarctica are penguins and seagulls and things like that, right? But at that point, they were much larger. Than, say, was it warmer there? Right? Um, was it cold and they had you know, the feathers kept them warm? And so, but that's what the paleoclimate is very interesting. Good. What else? Selfish reasons. So they can search for temperature, right? But I'm not going to have a time machine to go back and pick up temperature. But I'll just skip the Cretaceous heavy. It's too, too hot. Let's go to the Jurassic instead. See trends? Why? Mm -hmm. Right. So if we see you know, the period of ice age and warmings, right, it's like, what leads to an ice age? Because an ice age would be bad right now. You know, last ice age we had um, Boston running like a mile of ice. Right? That really hurt property values. Right? <coughs> so when, uh, when, what triggers ice age? Okay. Um, for warming, it's been warm in the past. Does herbivory increase when it's warmer? Or do plants grow more when it's warmer? And so we have evidence for that. So we can now predict with global warming, you know. So if so anything else is happening, you know, we're going to have more insect damage or less insect damage. Okay. Good. Okay, trace fossils. So this should be clear, yes? No. Okay. So the paleontologists who say this within this would be clear. So what we have here is a worm burrow. And then this stuff is a trilobite burrow. And what one of those things happens is this is evidence of how trilobites would feed. So if there's a worm, a bit of mud, and a trilobite found its burrow and went down after it with its claws trying to grab it from here. Right. So you can see, you, know, you, have, you, don't see, you don't see the worm, you don't see the trilobite, but from their traces, so like their footsteps, you know, as evidence for how they behave. It's pretty cool to figure out, you know, fossilized behavior around these the bodies. <coughs> See the same thing with footprints, right? The dinosaurs move in herds or singly. And I just find, you know, a skull doesn't tell me that, right? I find a fossil trackway, and I say, oh look, the babies move in the middle of the herd and the adults from outside, right? Um, I can figure out how fast they moved right, from the spacing of the, of the knowing the limb length and knowing their footprint spread. Right. Um, figure out how fast they moved and what their, what their you know, structure was. So we find that you know, sword probably didn't move in herds, you know, um, 
the TBX hundred packs are single. If you have enough TBX traps, you find that out. So, then trace loss information. <coughs> Is that feeding data? So leaf miners are insects that live within a leaf, and the entire world is a seemingly two-dimensional world of the leaf. They're inside that and digging their way through. And you can see as they go, they get bigger, right? They get bigger and up. You can see in a little bit of a and wider and wider leaf. Okay. And so, and you still you still you want to get a good fossil, and so brought that in, throw that away, get a nice fossil instead. Right? <coughs> it was able to ascertainment bias, right? Or the type of bias for getting, in this case, the good looking fossils. And what these people have done is they went out and got all the fossils. You know, the ugly ones, the nice looking ones, just any fossil they bring back in. And they can quantify leaf damage through time. So they look at the leaf fossils across the thermal maximum time, so you know, 5,000 fossil leaves, and found the amount of damage and the diversity of damage went up with temperature. So I can figure out that so with, with rising temperature, plants aren't going to make more chemical defenses, they're just going to suffer more. And we know from, you know, 55 million years ago, using this fossil damage. The evidence of things like coprolites. Figure out <coughs> what this dinosaur is eating by looking for you know, little bits of silica or other, other traces in, it, in its fossil poop. Right? Because it has lots of information there. Same thing with ground sloths in California, but now stick to figure out what they ate and looking at their fossilized feces. You can find fossil you know, Regular body fossils. Right? So here, this is it. Right. You know? Yep. Nope, it's collecting something we're not to see. Nectar. Is that one flower? You're right. right. So plants produce nectar and flowers, which you all think about all number of carbons. Becomes, but they also have what's called extra floral nectars. Nectar, nectar producing parts that are outside the flower, extra floral. And so, we put elements in the And there are fossils in them too. And why would a plant do this? Here, yeah, I take some of my bounty. I love nature. Protection, right? It's like hanging them off. Your, your business, right? You pay out for protection. And so, <coughs> by paying off the ant to stay around there, then the ant will take out other herbivores that come by or worse things that come by. Right? We actually put into the tropics that you know, have a clearing all around them because the ants that live in them attack anything that comes near, including other plants. So they trim off the other plants. So we have this nice little area of this DMZ around the plant. Because that's paying off the ants to get protection. <coughs> we can find out evidence from the different wall and find these structures in fossils. Um, you can find other evidence from fossils, and here's the really well preserved Cambrian organism, which I was thinking about their internal structure from fossils. Right, so, fossils aren't just, you know, some fossils are just the outside cast. So what's actually you to develop the internal structure? That opening slide. Right? How do we know that boa constrictors ate sauropods? Right? Well, we found a fossil one inside a nest, and it apparently broke an egg inside it. Right? And from also from the sauropod. 
Um, sometimes we can run, we go wrong about this too. Who's, who's heard of over raptor? Yeah, what's over raptor? Egg thief, right? How do we know that? <laughs> thief, yep. Yeah. So the scientists have discovered it, found it on top of a nest, and said, oh look, it's you know, hunting the eggs. Actually, it was, it's, it was, it's, it's eggs. So actually, it was protecting its own offspring. As it has a bad rap about forever, everyone was mistaken about the belief that it was fossil. Right? So you have to be careful about this. Um, and this we go out and get other evidence to find, oh wait, that sort of shaped egg is supposed to find over after embryos in there. Hmm. It's not it needs something else. Um, probably yeah, eggs and other things. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I mean, probably small, small vertebrates as well. Um, you'll find other things about you know, mechanical questions. So we have a T-Rex skull. And one question many of those wonder about was, was T-Rex a really cool active predator, or did it, you know, eat dead stuff, and scavenge it? Right? And you can tell when you do that if I'm trying to eat a live hadrosaur, it's running around, and so you have a very strong jaw, skull to be able to handle those stresses. So you can do the kind of analysis of the T-Rex skull and say, would it be strong enough to take down a struggling habitat with a snap? It's only if it's really good. Then it's not there. You look at where it happened in the future, it would be how it You look at the example of a hadrosaur tail bone, has a T Rex tooth in it with the bones growing around it. Which suggests what? It was alive and it was bitten, right? It still survived. So there's, in that case, at least one T Rex once bit a live hadrosaur. Which is still data. You know, it was a purely scavenger. You don't see you know, feeding da damage from scarab beetles on giraffes. Right? They, don't, they don't take out giraffes. <coughs> Phylogenetics. Seasonal way of understanding life. And so we'll talk about more about this later, but basically it's a like, family tree of things. You can reconstruct things down the family tree. So bird flu, let's say, okay, how does bird flu pandemic where to come from? You can look at where it occurs now, and you can drop it back down the tree where it came from. Yeah. Plus, you can what changes led it to become dangerous. So, okay, every time this species changes to A instead of T, it starts to start start being triggered with genes. So, it tells you know what parts of genes are. Here's a great example. Okay, so, these Tangara frogs. <laughs> and so we can measure current frog calls. Okay. And using phylogenetics, we can actually reconstruct what you know, the sound like. Right? And so the same way you can say, okay, so we're not that hairy, but no are hairy, chips are hairy, bulls are hairy. For instance, it's probably hairy. Right? Um, same sort of approach here, but now we can reconstruct the calls. So this is those so we can reconstruct that and then actually play it back to current frogs and say, you know, <coughs> you know, do you think it's sexy? Do you think this is sexy? Why might we why might we do why might we do that? I'm machine dated. No. We want to know why species are different. Right? One thing that causes species to be different is they don't produce with each other. Right? An oak tree is not attracted to me at all. We're not going to have offspring together. It's some barrier in there. <coughs> and so where do those barriers appear? Okay, and so by playing, you can find out, oh wow, they don't interact with this, you know, they'll mate with, you know, this stuff here. They'll mate with this one. Hmm. You know, maybe it's some sort of barrier rose here. I mean, this sound um, must be done with this way. Let's see how that unfolds. Time for this, but it's cool. Um, here you can see what they did a main study of you know, this person's sister, and it shows itself. This is the ancestor, so it shows this person's all the way here, so it shows the, non the, the heterospecific parity counts. <coughs> mm. 
we used to look at things like latitudinal diversity gradient. Right? There's more species in the tropics. Why is that? Because there's more speciation rate in the tropics? And so here we see they both increase. The net diversification rate is about the same. The turnover rate, we're flipping over, is actually higher in the upper region. So it could have been that we'd find that speciation rate is higher than the tropics and the rate is constant throughout, or vice versa. And so it was kind of a turnover rate drive. Modern day, modern recent pieces tell us this. So these are <coughs> typical back to the very cool story of you know was, there were lakes that eventually the ocean managed to invade and fish got into the lakes and start to evolve, and then later on you know, the lakes were separated from the ocean, and later on the same thing happened again, and new fish came in. We had this sort of comparative, competitive displacement where some became adapted for living at the bottom, and at the bottom some became plankton feeders in the top. We've had multiple times so we've these different repeated evolutions to see what happens. Okay, and finally we can look at the experiments. So this is a tribolium beetle. Okay, very cool little beetles. You can easily just have a jar of flour dump them in. They'll survive, thrive, and have many offspring. And so we can do actually the studies of <coughs> in this case individual versus group selection. So if I select on a property of the group rather than the individual, can evolution respond? There have been lots of debates about, you know, are we selecting on individuals or groups and things? And this is actually way to just directly test it by doing an experiment in the lab. Okay. But then there are really macro questions. You know, depending on what the question is, the appropriate data set might be, you know, this or this or this that, depending on what the question is. And what's cool about macroevolution is you can say, you know, here's my question, I'm going to answer it this way. And then someone else can say, well, I don't think you're wrong, I'm going to use this data to get degrees. Way of testing the stuff. So that's why you get this direction. Experimental science, you can go out and test things by finding more data out of the world. Any questions about this? Yeah? What constitutes a macroevolutionary question? Is there some steadfast distinction between the long term? Oh, that's good. I should have mentioned this at the beginning of class. So first, macro and micro, the distinction was a lot of different processes were happening at that sc those scales. You don't think that anymore. The modern physicists suggest that you know, micro evolution processes writ large are macro evolution processes. So now it's pretty much, instead of having it's like the speciation level, extinction level, long time spans is macro evolutionary, but there's no bright line anymore. And so in this class, macro evolution is the process of evolution that are sort of at those time scales or the time special use. Good. Other questions? Okay. I'll see you on Wednesday or Friday.